So we need to go through some strengths and weaknesses and some key features of all of the methods that we're going to look at. In terms of your second unit, it's important that you really, really well understand the different methods and also the strengths and weaknesses involved in them. So um, as part of your questions in the, se in the second unit, you're going to get two pieces of data, one qualitative and one quantitative, and you're going to have to be able to identify what method has been used why it was used, strengths and weaknesses of using that method, and remembering to always talk about the study when you're answering it. Okay, so you need to know about longitudinal studies. Okay, longitudinal studies are studies that are done over a long period of time. Okay, that means that they're really good at getting this clear picture of people's lives and their behaviour, and that it can study them throughout their entire lives. Okay, so longitudinal studies done over a long period of time. The problem with them is that it's really hard to keep track of participants. Okay, so it's hard to keep track of them because you could be studying them for 20, 30, 40 years. It's hard to keep track of all these people and keep on top of their lives, if they move, if they move countries, whatever it is. Um, and there's also this danger of getting too close to them, that you can, you can feel like you have um, a closer relationship with them because you've known them for their entire lives. And then that can cause bias in your research, okay? Um, and it's very expensive to do. Okay, so longitudinal studies, really expensive, but you can get a really clear picture of behaviour. Okay, and um, you also need to know about questionnaires. They should be really reasonably straightforward for you. So questionnaires, it's just a list of questions. I'm sure you've all filled in a questionnaire at some point. Okay, and um, generally they can be done either way. So they're written down and they can either be posted or they can be handed out like in a town centre or in a college or something like that. Okay. They use open and closed questions, so questions that get qualitative data, some in-depth data that allow people to answer with their own words in their own time, and also closed questions that might be fixed choice, so yes, no, or which one of these do you prefer, so people circle the answer, okay? Um, generally, they should be quite short, people can't be bothered. I know the first thing I do when I get given a questionnaire is um, have a look through, see how many, many pages it is. So they should be quite short to keep people's interest. And questions shouldn't lead people towards an answer. So you can't, you can't force people into a particular answer through the question that you use. Okay, so leading questions shouldn't be used. And questionnaires have got their own strengths and weaknesses. So strengths and weaknesses... Um, is that they tend to have a low response rate, especially if they're posted. And if I get a questionnaire in the post, it goes straight in the bin. And um, so they have a low response rate. Um, and also another problem with them is that people tend to um, interpret questions differently. So what I think a question means, you might think it means something differently. And because it's been sent out in the post, you have no way of asking for clarification on the, what, what that question means. Okay, um, and interpretivists don't really like questionnaires because they say it suffers from researcher imposition. So this idea that the researcher is asking questions on what they think is important rather than finding out what the, the subject really feels and really thinks. So not allowing them to give their own thoughts and feelings and only asking on what they think is important. So questionnaires, positivist method, get scientific data. Okay, so really good. Um, because you can compare answers, you can put it into tables and graphs and you can produce data from it. It's very scientific, positivists really like it, interpretivists less so, okay? Um, you can get a large sample, you can send out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questionnaires, so it can be really representative, okay? It's, it's really, it's not very time consuming, it doesn't take a lot of time. Type up one questionnaire, print out 30 copies, stick them in the post. Okay. Compared to interviews that can take hours, it's much quicker. Um, they're quite good for asking sensitive questions as well. So if you're asking about domestic violence or something like that, if they're anonymous, if people know that their identity isn't going to be um, told to other people or released, then they're more likely to answer these sensitive questions. Okay, um, And... There's minimum contact with the researcher, so there's less likelihood for um, influence from the researcher or bias because they don't have that contact with them to influence their answers. Okay, so that's questionnaires. Another interpret um, positivist positivist method that you need to know is structured interviews. These are essentially questionnaires that are read out. 
Okay, so this time it's an interviewer who's reading out these questions, and um, the participant or the respond the responder has to answer them. Okay. The interviewer is really passive in this. They just read out the question and record the answer. They're not thinking of questions on the spot. They're not having a conversation. All they're doing is reading out these questions. Okay, um, and there's no flexibility in them that they can they can pick questions that they want to ask. They have to follow this interview schedule. Okay, and follow all of the questions that have been set. So everybody gets asked the same questions, which is why positivists like it, because it is then reliable. Everyone's getting the same questions. It can be repeated. You can get similar data, okay? Very similar uh, to a questionnaire um, and produces this quantitative data, so this scientific data, okay? And again, this has its own strengths and weaknesses. So um, strengths of it is that positivists prefer it because it's scientific, okay? So questionnaires, structured interviews, positivism, okay? Um, it's easy to quantify this data exactly the same as questionnaires. So your strengths and weaknesses for questionnaires and structured interviews, you can apply the same ones to almost all, both of them. Um, they're quite quick to complete and you can get a large sample because again, it's just reading these questions and, and ticking or circling the answer. So compared to where you're asking people to think and answer long-winded questions, it's much faster. Um, and also a better response rate than questionnaires. So if I post you a questionnaire, you might just put it in the bin. Whereas if I go to your house to ask you questions, if you're not in, I can go back and ask them again at a later date. Okay, so you can get a better response rate than questionnaires. However, you can be um, have interviewer bias. So people might give false or partial information. They want to make themselves look good. It leads to these demand characteristics where people might give an answer because they think that's what they should say rather than what they think. When you have somebody standing in front of you, you react to their reactions from you. So if you start to say something and they, they pull a funny face or they look concerned, you're gonna change what you're saying, okay? Um, they're very inflexible, just like questionnaires, which means that you can miss out on data. You might not get true thoughts and feelings or the, the true uh, valid answers of people that you could get with more open questions. Um, and again, we uh, suffer from this researcher imposition that I talked about for questionnaires. Okay. Okay. Uh, positivists also really like statistics. Again, this measurable data that they can gain scientifically. Okay. So official statistics, it's this numerical data um, and it's produced by the government if it's official, so the census, okay, the general household survey, two really good examples of official statistics that the government produce. You can also have unofficial statistics, okay, and these are collected by non-governmental bodies, so charities, think tanks, uh, political parties, employers, colleges, education system, all of these collect data on whatever whoever they're working with and then that can be produced into these unofficial statistics that sociologists can then use as secondary data. Okay, so official statistics also fall under this secondary data. Um, and again, strengths and weaknesses, so really cheap really easy to access on the internet, doesn't cost anything. So in terms of doing data, if you don't have a lot of money, then these um, statistics are a really cheap way of getting some data, okay, and quite quick as well. Um, they're usually really up to date patterns and trends. So in terms of this positivist patterns and trends, looking for this in terms of behavior, they can be produced two, three, four months ago. So they're incredibly up to date. Um, and they're often generated using large representative samples, which means that we can then generalize it back to the population. We can assume that that pattern can be applied to everybody. Um, and they show trends over a period of time. So you can compare older data with newer data to see if there's a difference, okay? But it might not be as representative as you think. Um, it might not give the whole picture. Depending on who's collected the data, they might have an agenda in what they're looking for. So they could have left out some data that you don't know about. So it might not be as trustworthy worthy as you think it is, okay? Um, statistics can be manipulated to show what they want. So again, not always that reliable. And they tell us very little about human behavior and human experiences. So if we're looking for that in-depth, rich data, we're not gonna get it from statistics, okay? Okay, we've also got content analysis, okay? Generally, this is quantitative data, okay? So content analysis, this is using these media products. We talked about this in terms of Amanda Knox and how they looked at what the newspapers in different countries were saying about her to get a, a view on what people thought about what she'd done. 
So these media products, and it gets a picture about the society that we live in, okay? And they're usually done um, using a content analysis schedule, okay? So this is a list of things that the sociologist is looking for. So they might be looking for particular words, and every time they see that word, they tick it off and say, yeah, I've seen that once, twice, three, four, five times. Okay, so it generates this quantitative data, okay? So it's recorded how often they see the thing that they're looking for, okay? And it's sometimes used in a qualitative way, uh, but not very often, okay? So content analysis is generally quantitative data. And again, that has its own strengths and weaknesses, okay? So strengths of this is that it's really cheap. All you have to do is buy the paper or the magazine, okay? Um, it's comparative, so you can look at older newspapers and newer newspapers, you can look at them across different countries, different societies, that you can compare it, which makes it longitudinal, remember, over a long period of time, which means that you can look at newspaper articles over 20, 30 years to compare patterns and trends in society, okay? Um, and it's... Um, reliable because another sociologist can get those same newspapers and see the exact same things, okay? But it can be really time consuming. It takes a really long time to trawl through all of these articles. You could have hundreds of articles to go through. Um, and it's subjective. It's what, it's what the researcher thinks they're seeing in it. It might be what they interpret from the article. It's not always really objective. Um, and it can't prove the effect that this article has on the audience. It has no information about what the audience actually think. It can only tell you what the reporter has written, okay? So then we also have these um, qualitative methods in, in uh, sociology, and this is what interpretivists prefer. So remember, they're looking at this for staying. They're looking at these um, meanings that people attach, the, their understanding of the world around them and how we can understand the world from somebody else's point of view. So ethnography is a really important term that you need to know what it is. So this is writing about a way of life or culture, putting yourself and immersing yourself in their lives, in their society, in their culture, and participating in their daily activities, okay? Such as when we looked at gang leader for, for, the, for a day, okay? So ethnography is about putting yourself, immersing yourself into somebody else's life and understanding it from their point of view. So in terms of ethnography, then we have unstructured interviews. Okay, so unstructured interviews are a lot more fluid. Okay, they're more like a guided conversation. So they will have an aim that they want to reach and they will have two, three, maybe four questions that they definitely want to ask but they will let the conversation guide what they're asking. And if a participant or a subject gives a really good answer, or they go off topic, but it's really interesting, then interpretivists like that you can follow that line of questioning up and you can go with them and see what they're gonna say about something, okay? Which means it's really flexible. Um, and it gives you this in-depth study of the research topic. You can find out what people really think and really feel about what you're interviewing about, okay? But it does have its strengths and weaknesses, so. Strengths are, it's really good at establishing rapport. You can build up this trust with people. They can get to know you, you can get to know them, and you can build this up, okay? So you get a fuller picture. It means it's more valid, okay? Um, respondent is at the center of the research, okay? So um, they might be more likely to discuss sensitive stuff because they're getting to know you, they trust you, and they understand what you're gonna do with the data, you've explained it fully to them. So they might be more willing to talk about more sensitive material. And it's really flexible, okay? So um, you can follow up on interesting points. You don't have to stick to an interview schedule. It means it's highly valid. It gives us in-depth, rich information, okay? It allows us to look at people's lives from their point of view and how they understand the world around them, okay? But it tends to gather a lot of information that you then have to look through and pick out the bits that are relevant, which then means that it could lead to bias, that you might leave out stuff that you don't think is important, but actually is important to that person. Um, it is difficult to analyze. You can't really compare it. You can't quantify it. You can't quantify what people think and feel. You can't compare it, okay? Um, and it means you have fewer respondents because they take so long. Um, you have fewer people that you interview, which means that you're gonna have a less representative sample, which means that it's gonna be less generalizable, okay? Um, observation is the last one you need to know about. So this is a biggie, okay? Observation 
you have participant and non-participant. Participant where the researcher is taking part in the daily activities, they're part of this culture, they've immersed themselves in it, um, they play an active role, okay? They generally use a structured coding scheme, so they're looking for specific behaviours that they can then tick off, okay? Oh, my bad, that's non-participant. Non-participant is where they sit and watch, okay? So they're not part of it, they don't take an active role. Okay, they're only ticking off behaviours that they observe. Participant is where they take an active role. Okay, and they tend tends to be mostly used, and they get this rich data from it. You can have overt and covert. So overt where the group knows who the researcher is, covert where they don't know who he is or she is. And the aim is to understand um, lives from the point of view of the group. Okay, um, and it can depend on access through a gatekeeper. So this can be um, access through a person that can uh, give consent. So if it's children, you might need access granted from a parent or a teacher. Or it can be if it's a group that's hard to get hold of, then um, you might need a gatekeeper to get you that access. And again, have their own strengths and weaknesses. So Verstehen, it's highly valid. Okay, get the point of view of the group. Um, what people say and do are often different. So by watching them and being part of their lives, you can get a truer picture of what they actually do rather than um, these demand characteristics where they might say they do something different. Um, respondent validation. So this is um, after the research is done, you can show them what you've done with it. You can show them your write-up. You can tell them what you're doing and they can say, yeah, that is what I said. That is what I did. So they can validate your research. They can say, yeah, actually, I agree with that. Um, it makes it more valid. Okay, Make sure that it's not misunderstood. Okay. So respondent validation is where they can say, yes, I agree what, with what you've written. That's a true representation of me and my life. Um, and it's good for uh, reaching groups that are hard to find, so criminal groups. However, um, researcher effect. People can act differently if they know they're being observed. Um, if you think about teachers in Ofsted inspections, generally they act differently if they know they're being observed. Um, going native is a problem. This is where you immerse yourself so much in another culture that um, you start to become biased and you can't see it in an objective way anymore. Um, I can't read my own writing. Um, oh, uh, there tend to be micro studies, so you can't really get a wider picture. So this interpretive method of looking at these small scale um, interactions, these small scale studies, so you can't really generalize it back to a wider population because it is just one section of a group. Um, there can be danger to the sociologist. Um, Ken Price was a sociologist who was murdered whilst doing research, so especially entering criminal grand gangs and stuff like that, that there is this danger to sociologists that they could get hurt or get involved in criminal activity. Okay, right, those strengths and weaknesses, you do need to make sure that you're learning them and that you know them. You are going to need them in lesson this week. All right, thanks.